FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it's October 4th, 2017. How time flies. We're in that crucial fourth quarter of the year. Well, we're always trying to bring you new guests, new views, new outlooks on things, and we're going to do that right now. But first, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com with any questions or comments. So with us now is Bruce Thornton, and he's the... Shulman Journalism Fellow at Freedom Center and a lot of other titles and honors as well, which we don't have time for. But Bruce, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Hey, so frontpagemag.com is probably where you want to go to read Bruce's work and a lot of other great articles. Your latest one today, the Civil Rights Movement, Rest in Peace. Uh, <laughs> do you think that uh, rumors of the Civil Rights Movement death are greatly exaggerated? No, I think it's been totally transformed, um, you know, mainly because most of the battles, the main battle was won, the dismantle legal segregation. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it, you know, got caught up in identity politics. So the women's movement started to borrow some of the same rhetoric. And then every other identity group now uses the same rhetoric, whether or not there is a, a real civil rights you know, issue uh, to correct. Mm -hmm. So what happens instead is it becomes, uh, as I say, and it becomes an industry, particularly uh, the wholly owned subsidiary of the Democrat Party. And it advances identity politics now, which is the opposite of what the civil rights movement was about. It was about, you know, your rights under the Constitution that should be recognized. And now it's turned into a mechanism for leverage Right. By select groups, which does nothing for those members of that group who, for other reasons, have been left behind. And that, to me, is is, its most scandalous uh, characteristic. Yeah. Well, you look at something like the Southern Poverty Law Center. Exactly. Why do they exist exactly? Are they a money making entity that's shuffling dollars all over the globe uh, that would make money launderers uh, in the drug cartels jealous the way they can do it and get away with it? Well, I, I believe that they began as a, as a well-meaning institution to help advance the civil rights movement by identifying, you know, particularly, you know, groups like the Klan back when they were really meaningful. They're not now. Uh, and other, you know, various uh, groups that were founded on some sort of racist or exclusionary principle. And, and, and they did some good work there. But, you know, once you win the battle, pretty much, then what do you do? Yeah, you're right. Then it becomes an institution <laughs> that's supported by donations and there's money flowing in. And they, right. you know, every time, every time there's something happens, you know, some crank paints something on a mosque or, or there's a, a cross burn somewhere, you know, some fringe uh, group does something, well, then that's, that's, their, uh, that's their means of getting more donations. And you can track that with the ACLU and all these guys. After, every, after Charlottesville, you track and see what their, what their contributions, what happens. So they have a vested interest in these sorts of, of uh, incidents. And if they, you know, aren't as frequent or whatever, then you have to elevate them into something more meaningful than they are because there's a lot of money involved in these things. The, the people running these, oh, these yes. outfits, they're not working for free. Yes, we know that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And, you know, it's just amazing, though, that they probably have uh, branded uh, Front Page Mag a hate group. They're great. At, they did, uh, yes. Yeah. So how are you yeah. guys a hate group exactly? <laughs> what did I miss? What have you been doing that has been so hateful and spiteful and racist and fill in the um, blank here? I, I think mainly it has been, we have a lot of people that are telling the truth about Islam and the roots of, his, of Islamic mm-hmm. Jihad, which is one of the big, you know, bipartisan lies that are told. Oh, completely. Uh Yes, and they've been telling the truth about it. So that then becomes Islamophobia, a completely made up, you know, what they call a hate crime. Yeah. And so this is a way to try to silence or marginalize anybody who is 
was out there telling the truth and saying, look, you know, just just read, just read the Quran, read the Hadith, read yeah. Muslim historians. Right. This is a consistent 14 centuries long uh, element oh, of Islam. God, yeah. And so they don't want to hear that because the consensus is nothing to do with Islam. You know, that's a oh, religion yeah. of tolerance and peace. And the religion you of know, peace. these are some heretics. Yeah, of course. Religion of peace. Uh, never mind the fact that they're still fighting the Crusades, <laughs> you know, thousand, twelve hundred years later. I mean, this is a bizarre, bizarre thing. So yet, like, where does the SPLC get their money from, Bruce? I don't quite understand that. Is that just all donations? Well, like most, yeah, most organizations, they get them from donations, donors, donors who are sympathetic to their cause. Now, I'm not sure whether they get any Taxpayer money, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know that. I, I don't think so. I think that there's enough people, you know, wealthy uh, progressives, right, who, yeah. <laughs> who live in neighborhoods that only other wealthy people live in, but they care yeah. about the common people and the oppressed. So, you know, you got those kinds of outfits that those kinds of people that are, are making. Don you have a lot of foundations. Don't forget. Yeah. Sure. that make contributions to these organizations. And mm -hmm. one thing we should all remember, and I'm sure you know about, a foundation is a way for people of means to avoid paying taxes. Yes, right? so I've heard there, that. You've got a lot of these, and by law, they have to distribute a certain amount of their holdings or their foundation. So you look around, you say, well, I, you know, I agree with, politically with these guys. I'll send them some money. You know, And everybody does that. That's, yeah. that's just the way it you're works. Your end of the year So that's what would be list. my guess. Yeah, your end of the year list. But there really are, like you said, they're a uh, cure in search of a disease, right? I yes. mean, what do these guys do other than, I, I'm sure I'm a hate group too. I mean, it's something that you should probably wear proudly at this point, uh, right? Well, it's like in Casablanca when Rick says he's on Gestapo's list and he calls it the role of honor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Right? It's, uh, you know, it, you're known by your enemies as well as by your friends. So, yeah. Now, I. It, 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 you know, it's it's a strange it's a strange uh, phenomenon because on the one hand you have people that are obviously true believers. I mean, mm. uh, activists. Uh, they really, really believe this. And those are the scary ones. Then you have people that are just it's a fashion statement mm -hmm. to say that. You know, well, I give to the Southern Poverty Law Center, you know, and in certain circles, that's going to be a mark of status and right. of your compassion and sophistication. You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, you know, status thing, signaling, virtue signaling, virtue signaling you know, yeah. a, a lot of um, lifestyle markers that are involved in all of these organizations and, mm -hmm. and what they do. And see, that's what that was one of the major points of my piece is that when the, when the civil rights movement started, you know, early on before 65, 64, I mean, it was centered in the black church of the South. A lot of people forget this. Right. Right. And. It was really fighting against a, a, a very easily defined and recognizable uh, injustice, you know, legal segregation. And that was that battle was won by the passing of the Civil Rights Act and the, you know, criminalizing of legal segregation, basically, and dismantling right. of legal segregation. But, you know, at that same time in the 60s, identity politics comes in. Mm -hmm. And identity politics is based on a grievance. Why do you belong to this group? Because you, you, your group has been historically discriminated against, all right? And you have a grievance. Well, what happens to grievance politics when the grievances are settled? Well, they're not just going to fold their tent and go home, are they? No. They're going to find other grievances, hence microaggressions. That's the dead giveaway, hey, isn't it? What is it? Can I a ask you a question? Can I ask you a question here? Bruce, mm -hmm. what the hell is a microaggression? Because I don't understand the entire concept. But I saw a video. <laughs> it's whatever of a, you want it to be, man. I saw, if you're a yeah. member of a grievance outfit, a grievance uh, cohort demographic, it's whatever you say it is. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, if you were a living in the South under Jim Crow, and even in the fifties, right. Uh, you didn't have to search for microaggressions. They were all macro. They were macro. You could big see time. them from outer space. Yeah, right? You could see time. them from outer space. And I was alive back then, and I had Southern relatives, so you know, so I, I had some sort of firsthand. It's amazing. People don't even know today. Uh, a lot of them, what it was like. 
Oh yeah, and even Washington D.C. When you have to say, when you have to say, it's an aggression so subtle that you can't see it unless I explain it to you, <laughs> right? Because you used a word like monkey, all right? Yeah. Or Chicago or crime. These are all these are all dog whistles. Oh, they're basically. triggers. They're the dog triggers. whistle is the is the other part of the microaggression, right? It's the way you signal to your fellow racist that you're really talking about black people. Oh, so we have right? a code. You're not talking about crime. You're talking about black people. We got a code. Right. We got a special secret yeah. little code. And we have uh, secret handshakes, too. Don't forget about that. You know, oh, yeah, of course. Of uh, course. You know it, you know what? It reminds me of this an old joke. I think it used to be at Nashville, uh, the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, an elderly lady calls the police and says, there's a man exposing himself to me out my side of my window. So the policeman, he comes and he goes up to the window and he looks around and he says, so, well, where is he? She says, over there. And he says, I can't see anything. And she said, of course you can't. You're not using the binoculars. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they've got, they've got uh, the binoculars, right? The, the, the subjective, uh, so subtle that you can't see it unless somebody, right? puts the binoculars to your eyes and it's, it's, it's yeah. leverage. See, it's a, it's a way to have political leverage, social leverage by making somebody do something you want them to do. That's the I definition gotcha. of power, right? I gotcha. Well, you make somebody do something you, you, you know, and unfortunately yeah. too many of our establishment Republicans have been become experts oh, yeah. at, you know, giving into this for years and years. Enablers. They're enablers, and, right? Yeah. They're enablers. Pardon me? Simple. They're totally enablers. The uh, rhinos yes, here. Yes. Well, I just want to recount yeah. the story to you where you talk about macroaggressions. And this was in our nation's yeah. capital. In the early 60s, my father went, had an appointment there, and he got on a bus, and he there were no open seats in the front, and he went to the back of the bus. That bus driver would not take off, would not resume the ride until my father moved to the front of the bus and stood because yeah. the back of the bus was only for blacks. That sounds pretty macro yeah. to me. I haven't seen that happen probably no. in my recallable lifetime. No. I don't think I've ever seen it. But So we'll just have yeah. to worry about dog whistles and triggers and microaggressions. Yeah. Trigger warnings, yeah, yeah. You know, my mother That's used the to, giveaway. Yeah. You know. <laughs> my mother used to say... That's a sign of improvement. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, we're progressing on all fronts. My mother used to say, if you're looking to find something, you're going to find it. And that's that's what the grievance industry, yes. the cottage industry does here, right? I mean, they're looking for, yeah. for hurt. They're looking to be offended and they find it behind every door. Exactly. Again, if it's not if it's not even there, you make it up. Like the exactly. whole foundation of Black Lives Matter and the NFL protests, for example. Oh. Now they're trying to say, oh, it's about this or that. No, Kaepernick started it explicitly in support of Black yeah, Lives Matter, and that's how it began. And now because of the blowback, they're trying to back away from that. But that narrative that policemen are wantonly hunting down and extra-legally assassinating black men, that is such a preposterous lie that simple statistics expose all the time. Oh. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? It still motivates them. They'll still tell the, you know, tell the tale uh, because enough people, particularly Democrats, liberals, will just reflexively, you know, nod their heads up and down and say, oh, yes, isn't this terrible? Um, so, you know, you just have to you just have to push back. And I think one thing Trump understood through some instinctual cunning is that. You can't push back the way Romney and McCain and these other these other establishment Republicans who are all about decorum and everything. They don't understand, you know. Mm -hmm. They're in yeah, a totally. they're in a street fight, right? And the other side will use every they'll use brass knuckles, they'll use blackjacks, they'll use every nasty technique possible. And you can't stand there with your fists up like an eighteen ninety engraving fighting by the Marcus of Queensbury rules. No. Right? Totally so not. he came in and he says, okay, I can street fight, so let's street fight. Yeah. And then the, then the establishment, oh, this is terrible. You know, you, you, you're, you're not acting He's presidential. Mean. You're, you know, He's you don't have mean. decorum, right? Yeah, I know. I love it. I think, you know, you always hear even, even Fox News bemoaning his yeah. use of Twitter. And it's like, 
don't you guys understand it? There is no other way to engage no. these people on a, you know, you're not on a level playing field and, and they don't understand the concept of trolling either. Like during the election, when he deliberately misstated a fact about black oh, on yeah. black crime, he did it so that the uh, media couldn't ignore it. And, and then right. they were all over the story pushing his, his, uh, his viewpoint yeah. Yeah. and uh well and, what, yeah. the way i put it in a piece it's like you ever seen a kid with a laser pointer and a cat yeah exactly you, know, I you read put that the laser pointer on the floor and move it and the cat chases it that's what trump does he takes that yeah. laser pointer and he moves it and the media and the, the dims they all jump on it and then yeah. as soon as they're there he's moved it someplace else meanwhile with the other hand he's deregulating he's doing all this stuff while they're distracted well they're so, so they're so disingenuous they are so uh, blatantly uncurious about anything that matters you know it's it's really they just don't care they've abdicated their role as news gatherers what was the role of uh, news was who, when, where, what, why and how yeah. and then like in journalism school you'd write an article and the professor would would review it and said, oh, you missed the where there. Go rewrite this. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, this one's missing a how. Go back and do it again. It was really a very simplistic, simple, I don't want to even call it a profession, but a job. And they've made it into something totally different that doesn't resemble what journalism is any longer here. You know, Bruce. It's, well, it's it doesn't. Really... It's nothing like the idea they claimed. You yeah. know, they transformed journalism starting in the 20s. They thought, well, this is going to be like a profession. Right. Right. Well, Whereas, I mean, you look at movies in the late 30s, early 40s, like it happened one night, Clark Gable or, oh God, or yeah. the front page. A, a journalist was like a plumber. Right. He, mm -hmm. he wasn't he wouldn't be allowed in polite society. You know, well, he was like a. A, a PI, a private eye, you know, who, who's looking yeah. through windows at people. And then they, after the war, then they start sending them to school and saying, no, it's going to be a profession. So they, so then you have to go to the university, to J school and get a college degree where you get warped by the liberal and progressive prejudices of the, of the university. Yeah. <laughs> and then they become activists again. They, be, they, they're, yeah. they're no longer journalists. They're activists. And we know when this happened, this happened in the coverage of Vietnam and this happened in the yeah. coverage of Watergate. Absolutely. Those were the two events. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, uh, you know, they, they were notorious drinkers, these journalists. Yeah. They were of like, of course. Yeah. And, and they would basically, you'd find them like right after they got the, uh, afternoon story out, Beeline to the bar, and uh, you know, yeah. that's, and they're still known to be, you know, world class uh, drinkers. So why are we treating oh, them like you know, their profession? My my wife was a journalist. She came out in in the seventies. She was still in high school. Worked for uh, the local McClatchy paper, which mm -hmm. back in the day was a good paper. Yeah, and right across the street downtown was I don't know if it was the Elks Club or someplace, and the old school guys, right? Mm -hmm. When they went out, she was on the second story. You could see the herd, right? Go oh. out, cross the street, <laughs> into the bar, you know, when she was just coming in. And, yeah, I mean, and that began to change, right? When those old school guys, vets yeah. from World War II, some of them, or, you know, most of them didn't have college degrees. They just worked their way right. up. Then you started to get the college graduates come in. Right. Mm -hmm. They in the 60s were all fired up about beating crusaders for social justice and righting wrongs. And, you know, their cliche uh, affl uh, afflict the comfortable, comfortable and uh, comfort the afflicted. Yeah. Right. Oh, please. Yeah. No, no, no. Your job is to try to tell the truth. Yeah. Once they make that shift and that happened, like I said, that happened and became obvious uh, towards the end of the 60s with the coverage mm -hmm. of the Vietnam War. Yeah. And then Watergate. Watergate was the was the real event that made them all think, "Hey, we're crusaders for justice. Who's going to get? And we're going to get a book contract and a movie made about us, and we're going to become celebrities, right?" And they had a monopoly for a while; they could get away with it. Mm -hmm. And what's happened with the internet now? They no longer have a monopoly, and I think that's part of what has made them so hysterical, mm. right? Is they see that influence they want they once had. Uh, slipping away from them. 
losing power. And where once you had maybe 40, 50 across the country opinion makers, now you've got thousands and thousands. Hey, and, right? and the Bruce, let's not forget that uh, there are YouTubers out there that do better yes. political commentary and better political satire than anybody on the mainstream yes. media. And that is really, yes. and, and the production quality, a lot of these YouTubes is quite extraordinarily high. Oh, and they are saying, sure. well, if an idiot uh, in living in the attic of his parents' house or in the basement or whatever can do, put out work product better as good or better than what we do, we are dinosaurs. We are headed for extinction. Of course. And don't forget, too, what they had, what CBS, ABC, the New York Times, about maybe not even 10 major newspapers in their columnists, right, across the country Mm -hmm. in the three networks. What they had was a monopoly on information. Yes. Because information was hard to get. I remember I started my research career pre-internet. If I wanted to get information, I had to call myself to the library. I had to dig out some big, dusty bound book, and it would be three years out of date. Right? <laughs> I know, I know. Now, you know, if I if I want to know what's the what's the average GDP of the eurozone nations, right? Mm-hmm. I can get it in three seconds. Yeah, I yeah. get it as fast as I can type it into the window. And it comes up. And see, now everybody can access just about everything. Very and good. so that once you take that monopoly away from them, and as you said, and once you can produce a video, well, hell, with your iPhone, you can scoop any journalist. Yeah. They're, they don't have that advantage anymore, either images or information. Then what do we need these guys for? Good question. And what I do think, they bring to the table? I think, we'll, right? <laughs> I think we'll leave it at that. Hey, Bruce, it was great <laughs> having you on the show here. And we find your work at frontpagemag.com, correct? That's correct. And any other sites we should be aware of? Uh, well, I'm also a, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and, and They have a a great online magazine called Defining Ideas. You can find it on the Hoover website, and I write I I write for them uh, often too. Um, And those often will turn up on front page as well. Yes. So they'll they'll be in the archives. So you know, I try to keep busy and stay off the streets. So. <laughs> hey, and it's something that we just <laughs> don't have enough of is actually ideas and debate. Little things like that that really were the hallmark of America and our system. Yep. It's gone now. Well, anyways, uh, again, write us kl at kerrylutz.com. If you've got a question for Bruce or myself or anybody else you heard on the show, by the way, uh, check us out on Twitter at Kerry Lutz on Facebook, Financial Survival Network. Bruce, been a total pleasure. We thank you profusely for coming on the show. We'll definitely be talking to you again real soon. Great. Thanks a lot. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 